On your Thursday episode of Locked On Raptors, stop me if you've heard this one before in the last month and a half. Emmanuel Quickly and Grady Dick played really well. The Raptors lost. Let's get to it today. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, April the 11th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us in the Locked On Raptors Discord server. The link is in the description of the podcast. It's free to join. I, if I, if you haven't joined yet, I don't understand what you're doing. It's a wonderful place to come and talk ball with people just like you who are a little sickos about your 25-win Toronto Raptors. So come hang out. We would love to see you in there. It's a great little family we got building around the show. Of course, you can find the show for free. Where you get your podcast, follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend on all your favorite audio app of your choosing. And of course, you can join us over on the uh, YouTube channel as well. Subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, get a heads up every single time the show is about to premiere or go live via push notification it's a wonderful thing so you never miss a second of the show today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel make every moment more right now new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed with just a single bet that's 150 bucks win or lose with FanDuel.com slash locked on go there and get started and we'll get started today Digging into a 106-102 Raptors loss to the Brooklyn Nets in their third to last game of the season to fall to 25 and 55 on the season. Uh, we'll get into Grady Dick, who had himself a really nice game going with 14 three-point attempts. We love to see him emptying the clip. We got the good, the bad, and the hmm. We'll talk about Emmanuel quickly off the top, and we'll do it all with the God of the Game recap here for his final game recap of the season. It's Jamar Hines from Raptors Republic. Jamar, this is a somber day. Yeah, yeah, we're at the end of the road here. Uh, <laughs> it kind of, it kind of went by a little bit fast. Some parts were a little bit depressing, like March, but you know, <laughs> it's been a pretty entertaining finish to the season, I'd say. Also, side note, appreciate the Denver Nuggets support. Hey man, they are uh, the coolest basketball team alive with the coolest player who's ever existed in the history of basketball. Maybe Wemby's going to supplant him at some point in my heart as the coolest and most enjoyable player of all time. But uh, for now, it's Jokic, baby. We're uh, The Denver Nuggets are the official team of Locked On Raptors once this whole regular season thing <laughs> comes to an end. That is canon, and uh, I know yourself are a, a big Nuggets fan. So yeah, happy to support the fellas uh let's get to it man let's talk about this game like it's been the case for the last month and a half when he's been in the lineup it feels like emmanuel quickly is the place to start again right 32.7 boards nine assists 10 to 24 from the field four of 11 from deep makes it back with eight of eight at the line hit a huge step back three to take the lead late in this game they couldn't hang on uh they ended up losing this one by four points but uh emmanuel quickly man it's just a delight to watch a guy kind of understand his powers and he's doing it in a context that really should not be all that suited to like productive, effective basketball, considering the teammates he's playing with. But mm -hmm. since March the 1st, 21 points, six boards, nine assists on 57% true shooting with the burden he's carrying. Pretty, pretty bloody impressive. I think, you know, the three-point percentage has dropped off a little bit here, Jamar. That's to be expected. Most of that drop-off has come in the form of his catch-and-shoots, where he was at, like, 41% before March 1st, down to, like, 25% since. Some variance there, but surely a lot of it is catching passes from less good basketball players as well to create those threes. I'm just having an absolute joy of a time watching quickly play whenever he's in the lineup down the stretch. He has been the single best thing about the close to the season. What are your thoughts after uh, quickly's 32, seven and nine against the Nets last night? <clears throat> and honestly, when you talk about the three point shooting, even, you know, this month, the five games this month, it's at 38%. Yeah. despite the lack of talent that he's playing with at times. But yeah, if you just want to go in April alone, he's averaging 25 points and eight assists. So he's taking full advantage of, you know, the higher usage because of guys like Barrett and Barnes and even like a pick and roll partner like Pertl or out. Uh, quickly, you're seeing glimpses of what he can, you know, bring to the table next season, basically. Mm -hmm. um, he was huge down the stretch. I know the Raptors didn't win the game, but he had – 
not only just the step back three to go up 100 to 99, he had a step back three before that. He was using hesitation to get into the paint. Um, he all he all was falling, finding Grady, uh, for a few of his threes, um, mm-hmm. earlier in the game. And I just like Quickly's leadership overall. Um, he's been really fired up in these games. Um, he's been directing traffic well. Uh, yeah, just a lot of great stuff from Quickly that can translate into next season. Obviously, he won't have the ball as much, even though he's a point guard. He won't have the ball as much when other guys are healthy. But I feel like a lot of this can be translated. Yeah, I- I'm totally with you, man. I think uh, the the playmaking stuff like that's just you can't teach that right like he he's just mm-hmm. has such a great vision and I, I love the leadership point you make like yeah there's the raw raw leadership stuff but he also just has like a real command of the floor and that's like point guard stuff that's real right. like guy who can be the sort of finger on the pulse captain of the ship type stuff from emmanuel quickly and you know i think it is really interesting to think about how this version of quickly that we've seen kind of expand over the last month and a half since Scotty Barnes went down will blend with Scotty Barnes and to a lesser extent, Yaka Pertl next season, once they're all back together and playing with one another. And, and I think, you know, like you said, there'll be some trade-offs. It's not going to be in his hands quite as often. We're not going to see the traditional pick and roll or sort of just throw it to quickly and have him beat a dude off the bounce individually. There's going to be a lot more of sort of running stuff for him within the Darko Ryakovich offense, I'm sure, that we saw just a boatload of, even in the brief stretch we saw of him with Pirtle and Barnes together, you know, flying off of screen set by by Pirtle for those above the break threes that they were creating so easily. Um, you know, a lot of stuff that they didn't even really tap into between Scotty and quickly as well. That's probably the one sort of big question for me between those two yeah. guys is. How does that two-man game develop, and what can they do to amplify one another? They didn't quite find that chemistry so far, like in the minutes they've played with one another this year. But I think, given a summer to work with one another, a summer of playing lots of Call of Duty together, which apparently is a thing they're doing, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of sort of untapped potential with that two-man game as well. And how it all comes together is fascinating to me. Do you think there's any element we've seen here from quickly? that is just like not going to be part of the equation next season because of the different context of the team. Obviously, no one on the team to really support him right now outside of the odd times where him and RJ are in the lineup together. It's, you know, it's a very different context than he's going to play in next season. Are there things he's doing within this sort of strange skeleton roster context that are just not going to be part of the plans next season to your eyes? Um... First of all, I did not know he plays Call of Duty as well. I know Scotty does that a lot, so that's fun. But to answer your <laughs> to answer your question, honestly, I don't think anything he's doing right now will be taken away when the lineup is full. It'll just be a little bit less of like mm-hmm. the, probably his his three point attempts might go up actually because he might Absolutely. take more volume behind there. Remember earlier the season, Darko was telling him he needs to shoot more from three. Um, he probably will have less drives, but you still want him to be a finisher. And that's something he has been improving at as the season has gone along. Um, the Scotty and quickly two man game is, is a great point because, you know, we were talking about wanting to see a little bit more of that and, you know, utilize them, you know, a little bit better and, and more efficiently before Scotty went down. And honestly, I think quickly can also be utilized as more as a, as a cutter as well. When Scotty mm-hmm. is initiating offense and even Proto can do some of that. I feel like that's probably something untapped regarding quickly. But in terms of something he's doing right now, and it won't be a factor when the team is whole, I don't see it. I'm with you there. I think a lot of the stuff he's working on right now is just stuff that's going to enhance what he's able to do with better players around him next year, right? Like I think, you know, we've seen he's working on the finishing at the rim. He's getting downhill more often. That's only going to get easier when Jakob Pertl is setting Jakob Pertl screens for him and slingshotting him downhill, uh, which is something that we saw little bits of pretty tantalizing potential with those two guys just as a backbone sort of set play when things break down and you need to find something. Um, you know, getting to the rim, the free throws that he's been picking up, like the he's at six free throws a game since the start of March. The last three games, he's been over what 15, 10, and eight. I think of the last three free throw totals he's gotten in, in, in his last three times out. Like that, that's pretty meaningful stuff. He's also working in 
you know, the floater game we've talked about, that's a thing that's got to kind of find its level from New York to really kind of see the full version of quickly come to life, I think. But he's also working in these little counters to, oh, like, all right, I don't got to get all the way to the rim this time. I can keep a guy off balance and have this little baseline fade away from 16 feet that has turned into pretty uh, much you know, butter for him every single, every single time he puts it up. I feel like it's going in whenever he pulls that shot. Um, he's got these counters he's working in, and those counters come as a result of having to be the dude. And it's only going to get easier. I think it's just going to be kind of like dropping the difficulty level a little bit once you get to next season. And, and all of a sudden, you've got Scotty Barnes drawing two to the ball and Jakob Pertl creating from the elbows with his excellent passing for his position. It's all going to make life easier for quickly. And then you'll be able to sprinkle in these little sections of, all right, this is Quickly's time where he's going to go run high pick and roll or just go and ISO dudes and try to get to the rim and drive a million times. Like there's going to be pockets of the game for the Quickly we've seen right now. But mm -hmm. I just think all of what he's doing is just going to inform and enhance what he does next season. And man, oh man, I am extremely bullish on Emmanuel Quickly going into next season. I am uh, already thinking about... Uh, most improved player odds? Like, where are we at here? Okay. I uh, I don't think it's crazy. I think there's going to be a lot of room for quickly to kind of very clearly become the defined number two in the pecking order on this team behind Scotty Barnes. And considering Barnes himself is not like a pure, natural, go-get buckets type of dude, maybe quickly just becomes the leading scorer on this team. Maybe not the best player, but the leading scorer. And that's a perfectly fine way to sort of balance out what Scotty does well and maybe doesn't do at the super elite level himself. Um, fascinating stuff. We're going to come back on the other side, Jamar, and get into Grady Dick, who uh, 14 three-point attempts last night, baby. We love to see it. We're going to talk about Grady, his impact, and how his impact can be improved even more going into next season. We'll get to that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Nissan. Are you the kind of person that likes to push things a little bit further when you drive? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class-exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone, fiddling around with the Bluetooth and all that nonsense. No, Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play are built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. You can also go if you want to scale up in size and mess around with the 2024 Nissan Armada, which will change what you expect from a full size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to eight in first class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, we continue on here. Jamar Hines of Raptors Republic is here as we talk about loosely the sort of big broad strokes of a loss to the Brooklyn Nets. We don't got to get into the X's and O's of why they lost this game. <laughs> they lost this game because Malik Williams and Garrett Temple started for them, and that's fine. We know the deal at this point. Uh, the shameless resting, et cetera, et cetera. We're here, baby. It's tank season. We all know it. Uh, but some good things, again, happening on the fringes of this team, despite the losses piling up. And one of those things, again, Jamar Hines, Grady Dick. Yep. Pretty exciting stuff watching this dude get open 14 times for wide open looks from deep, canning six of them, 24 points, four boards in this game, nine to 20 overall. So he goes three of six on his twos, which has been a thing that has, you know, surpassed my expectations this season, his ability to finish inside the arc and the different craft and the the ways he has of scoring, you know, for mid-range, from at the rim, et cetera, et cetera. Um, man, oh man, Grady Dick, uh, thoughts on his uh, three-point explosion last night against the Brooklyn Nets? Yeah, career high, six made threes. I believe his previous career high was four. Mm -hmm. Also, it's kind of funny how he's going – He's um exceeding his career high points by points wise by one. It was twenty two, <laughs> now twenty three, now twenty four. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. But um, no, Grady, this is kind of what you were hoping for um earlier in the season when he wasn't quite ready yet. But no, it's 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 great to see the threes dropping. It's great to see him get uh crunch time minutes because that mm -hmm. was a thing for a little while where it's like okay, why is he not in in in, in crunch time he did make a big three in the corner down the stretch when you know teams were trading leads and stuff but 
Yeah, my biggest thing with Grady is actually on the defensive end that he hasn't been like a massive liability there because that Not was probably the one thing I was worried about the most. I mean, like I knew he could shoot, but the fact that he's been competitive on the defensive end, uh, that that's a that's a major plus for him to stay on the court and be in those crunch time minutes down the stretch. Even when the team is healthy, they can find a way to go, maybe go small and have him on the court as an extra shooter to space the floor. So, you know, for the future, I think that's huge for his um not only for you know his development but his confidence as well 100 percent. like team defender wise i think he's going to be just fine in the nba yep. right like he's long he knows where to be he knows just like the flow of the game and where he's rotating out to um contest shots pretty well i think like he's going to have the team defender stuff down it's obviously the individual stuff that's going to be an issue. And, you know, I was looking up a couple of weeks ago. It could have changed by now. But he was like literally bottom 5% in the NBA as an isolation defender on very small, uh, you know, a, a very small sample and frequency of, of, of ISO attempts. But, you know, that's not surprising when you look at his frame and you look at, um, you know, sort of guys sort of their eyes light up once in a while when the, oh, God, Grady's guarding me. All right, time to take it to this kid, um, which is fine. That was expected. I do think you know, the way the NBA is going, I don't think we see like mismatch hunting really be all that much a thing, especially in the regular season playoffs, a different beast, obviously. And we'll see the sort of playoff viability of Grady Dick's defense, hopefully in years to come. But, you know, in the regular season, teams aren't doing the mismatch game, right? They're trying to run their mm -hmm. systems. And a lot of teams are leaning towards more systems that, you know, relate to what the Raptors are doing, right? Where it's, you know, we're not going to divorce ourselves from the plan just to go and pick at one mismatch. We're actually going to play team basketball and we're going to stick with what we're doing. This is the Warriors thing that everyone got mad about for many, many years was, why don't you run Steph KD pick and roll? What's going on? It's like, well, because they have a system and they run it and they stick to it. And that's just how it works. And so I, I do feel like the sort of potential of Grady Dick becoming a routine target for mismatch hunting is not super duper high, especially considering the Nick Nurse Raptors are no longer a thing. Uh, <laughs> the the mismatch hunting is team that ever mismatch hunt. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not concerned about the, the sort of overall viability of his defense, especially when you consider what he means for the offense. Right. And I think, again, right. playing alongside better players, it's only going to enhance his impact, which is actually kind of an interesting thing. I want to talk about this. Rookies are bad, right? We know this. Rookies do not drive positive play most of the time. That's very much been the case with Grady Dick this season. Of all Toronto Raptors players to have played a 1,000 minutes or more, which I think is like 10 or 12 players at this point. It's a lot of dudes. Um, he has the worst on-off differential at a minus 10.8 net rating when he is on the floor. Or that they're 10.8 points per 100 possessions worse when he's on the floor than when he's off. Um it's just very normal rookie stuff, I think. It's just rookies have a hard time driving positive play. He's not there creating for others. He's there to amplify. He's obviously been playing with less than you know fully stacked rosters around him as well. But that is the thing that we hope to see start to tick up next season, which is the positive impact indicators when he's on the floor. I I'm curious, Jamar, like looking at him right now versus what he could be in six months, is there like a thing you need to see? What is the difference right now between sort of bad on-off impact guy Grady Dick of today and positive on-off impact guy Grady Dick in the future? Is it a Grady Dick thing or is it a team around him thing? Yeah, um, you told me that stat before this pod and I didn't even realize it was those numbers. But I don't put much of that on Grady much at all because you look at how many games over the last couple of months have we said that Grady Dick was the uh longest tenured raptor on the court which is which is <laughs> hilarious because this is his first season it's yes. like if gary trent jr was not playing with you know guys like, like yeah gary trent jr was not playing it was grady longest tenured raptor which is crazy mm -hmm. um he's gotten you know a lot of starts recently and you know barnes has been out forever pertle has been out forever barrett and quickly were out for long stretches so yeah it was literally trent and Grady and the uh, 40 point losses that they would take to the Pelicans. Like, obviously he's playing a lot of minutes there. So mm -hmm. a lot of this is skewed because of, you know, what is he going to do? And he, he actually had a career high in one of those Pelicans games. So it's like, it's just, it's just the fact of, you know, who, who you're playing with really. Cause yeah, some of those ugly blowouts is when Grady played the most minutes when the Raptors were actually a little bit more competitive. He wasn't even, sometimes he wasn't even with the Raptors. He was in the nine Oh five. 
So Mm -hmm. a lot of those numbers are just going to be skewed because of that. So I don't really take that too much into a factor. Um, The one thing Grady did talk about working on, and it's just a general rookie thing uh, post game is, you know, just working on his body so he could, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, take a little bit punish a bit punishment better on both sides of the court. So yeah, it's just, I just look at what he's been doing over the last two months. And it's just like, I don't see something that's, that he's doing specifically that's going to drastically change those numbers. It's just, I just think it's a lot to do with who he's playing with. Yeah. I, so I'm doing this thing on the podcast here, Jamar, where I'm posing a question that feels oh. perhaps loaded. And I also <laughs> don't actually agree with the, no, 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 I get it. I, I get forth. it. Uh, it's, it's a little podcasting trick. It's called misdirection. Uh, yeah, no, I, I am with you. I'm so not worried about the positive impact metrics eventually catching up to what we're seeing with Grady Dick, just like I test wise, right? Like he clearly fits on an NBA floor. He fits with all kinds of different players. He amplifies all kinds of different players and, you know, plenty of teams get by with so, so defenders. Right. And again, I think off ball, he stands a chance of being like, average to above average you know i I think that's totally there for him i I think a lot of it is the context right like yes the minus 10.8 net rating or on off net rating like okay like part of that is rookie stuff and not being super strong and not being someone who's gonna like uphold a defense and give you a defensive floor or anything like that is one of your better players out there um a lot of it is rookie stuff but i think it's amplified by the fact that he's not played with very good players you want to uh, know the answer to a pretty depressing trivia question? Um, oh boy. I sorted through all two-man lineups that Grady Dick was a part of uh, or has been a part of this season so far. Which okay. Toronto Raptor do you think Grady Dick has played the most minutes alongside? Well, this is depressing, right? So <laughs> I the, played the most minutes alongside. I'm going to take a wild guess and I'm going to say Jalen McDaniels. It's not Jalen McDaniels. He's lower down the tier. Uh, by the way, uh, it's a tease for tomorrow's podcast with Joseph Cacharo as we take up our bold predictions from the start of the year. Jalen McDaniels, Grady Dick, didn't play a lot together, and they were very okay. bad when they did. Um, but uh, no, the player that Grady Dick has played the most minutes with this season is Bruce Brown, acquired wow. at the uh, in the middle of January. Wow. Missed some time, obviously. Um, and then it's just been kind of a mainstay vet, mainstay vet for the team down the stretch. Yeah, Bruce Brown is the number one guy Grady Dick has shared the floor with this season. Number two is Kelly Olinick. Uh, Scotty Barnes yeah. is sixth on that list, like the sixth most minutes played with. So that's with Grady that tells Dick. you that tells you everything right there in terms of 100%. why he, the net rating type of stuff. But yeah, Jakob Pertle Jamar is thirteenth. And I think there's an exactly. argument to be made. Barnes and Pirtle are the two guys who Grady Dick could benefit playing with the yeah. most from, right? Yeah. So, so, yeah. That, to me, is the biggest difference. Is, uh, put I'm them sorry. with better Any, players. <laughs> anytime, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I've made my thoughts known about McDaniel. So anytime I hear the word depressing, it's like that's the first guy that comes to mind. So, And logically, it didn't make sense because he doesn't even play that much. But that's just automatically what came to mind. You weren't thrilled by Jalen McDaniels' three points on 0 of 3 shooting last night? Uh, man. I think I've just... been thrilled by one game he's played all season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a tough scene there, man. Um, again, more on that on tomorrow's show, which is an absolute bloodbath of an episode. Uh, but yeah, I'm uh, pretty optimistic about where, where Grady's going to be when playing with non humps. And uh, I think it's going to be all good for him on the impact front because the three-point shooting the gravity he has teams are going to be terrified of him getting loose for threes for many many years to come and i cannot wait to see all of the knots he ties defenses into with his shooting gravity as he levels up he looks like a real dude we'll come back on the other side we're going to round it out with the good the bad and the hmm to wrap things up as we always do on today's show thanks for hanging Before we get to that, today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Right now, it's playoff time coming up in the NBA and the NHL. You've got the baseball season in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed with just a single bet. Win or lose, it's $150 in bonus bets right into your account, regardless of the outcome of that first bet. Better than everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. 
Last year, I won money, betting money on the Denver Nuggets to win the NBA championship at the very start of the season. It was pretty good odds, and I was very thrilled that I was right about that one. Uh, probably not such good odds this time around as they are the defending champions with the likely MVP and Nikola Jokic, but, you know, the Boston Celtics are out there being all the favorites and stuff, got the easy route to the... To the maybe you can find some, yourself some good odds on the Nuggets to win the championship. Of course, the team of Locked On Raptors once the season is over, so you can go and uh, do that. Go explore on the uh, FanDuel app. Find yourselves those futures bets, not on just the NBA, but of course, baseball, hockey, it's all there for you. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On and make your first bet an automatic win fan duel america's number one sports book wrapping things up here with the god of the game recap jamar hines of raptors republic here for his final game recap of the season which means it's his final good bad and hmm of the season as a single tier falls down his face <laughs> uh of course i uh, just wanted to give you a heads up uh in the honor of the grand tradition of the good the bad and the hmm we will be having good bad and hmm week on the podcast probably not next week but the one after once we're into the playoffs and we're doing some reflection on the season uh we will have full episodes devoted to good full episodes devoted to bad and full episodes devoted to hmm things from this toronto raptors season so you have that to look forward to in your off-season content calendar all right jamar let's get to it it is the good it's the bad it's the hmm the way we wrap up every single episode of this podcast on the heels of a toronto raptors basketball game i think we liked I think we didn't like it. I think that's got us a wee bit intrigued from the most recent thing in Toronto Raptors basketball, which in this case is a four point loss to the Brooklyn Nets. What's your good? So we've already talked a lot about quickly and um, Grady, so I'm not going to go there. Where yes. I'm going to go is I believe it was a third quarter possession where Ochai Abaji just bodied the hell out of Dennis Schroeder <laughs> in the paint. <laughs> It was a really fun just 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 put him in the weight room, just backed him down for like it looked like five seconds at least, and then got the basket plus the foul. The bench that was probably the most fired up the bench was all game. Uh even <laughs> Gary Gary was giving it to Dennis a little bit. So yeah, that's that's that was probably one of the more fun moments. And especially when Scotty's on the bench. Scotty's always doing something. I think in this case he was doing the the Russell Westbrook rock the baby thing. So no, that was that was a fun possession. So, you know. I don't even know what Ochai finished with. Let me look. Was Seven that points? No. Okay. Yeah. I, was, I was wondering for a second if that was his only basket, but no, he he uh, he was three for six. But yeah, definitely the most memorable of his three baskets. So that's my good. Also, hang the banner. Ochai Abaji shot 50% or better from the field. Yes, <laughs> rarely happens, but it happened. Let's go. Positive steps forward, baby. Um, my good is, I guess, sort of related to that. It's, I'm kind of shocked by how good the bench vibes seem to be right now. Like they're in yeah. full on, they should be in full on one, two, three Cancun mode on the bench. The season is over in four days time. They're 25 and 55. They're playing on the second night of a back-to-back -back in Brooklyn at a dead arena against a crap team. And yet they're still there. They're alive. They're cheering. Bruce Brown is, is hollering and hooting from the sidelines. Right. I, uh, it seems like this team has a pretty decent spirit about it, which is a very refreshing thing after last season where that was very much not the case. Obviously, the results have not been there, and good vibes will only last so long without winning. But for the time being, it seems like Darko Ryakovic and his staff have been able to maintain pretty good vibes despite just a truly miserable season of up and down, confusing basketball. And I think that is pretty good. You have a point to add. Yeah, I do. It's just funny that we bring that up in a game against Dennis Schroeder when Schroeder and one of his pressers earlier in the season said that there is basically no vibes on the bench. Remember mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. It does feel like it's been way, and I'm not taking a shot at Schroeder or anything, but it does feel like it's been way improved since he's been gone. You've, you know, but, but, And then obviously that has a lot to do with Scotty himself being on the bench because Scotty in general just brings a bunch of positive energy regardless. Mm -hmm. So him being on the bench, and I obviously you don't want him on the bench, but him being on the bench just makes things more fun. He's always doing something funny. Um, he even had one of the coaches' shirts one of the, the other day. So, you know, so I, I, I'm pretty sure that improves the vibes a lot on the bench. But, yeah, I just thought, I thought, had a thought in my head, but how the season was earlier and you know before all the trades and all the uncertainty and once that's been cleared up i think the vibes have been a lot better on the bench with guys that you know they know they're going to be here for a while 
It's encouraging stuff. Uh, let's get to the bad. What is your bad from this game? Uh, the Raptors' bad was finishing at the rim. The Nets had mm-hmm. blocks. Um, they're obviously a smaller team as in comparison to Brooklyn, who has some length. So uh, Noel Clowney had seven blocks by himself. Uh, one of those was on Garrett Temple to end the game when you know they could have tied it and potentially sent it to overtime. And then uh, Nick Claxton had five blocks as well. So that's 12 between... Those two alone, the uh, Brooklyn outblocked Toronto fifteen to five. So I mean, it is a, it was obviously noticeable. You know, fifteen blocks is a lot of blocks. So you know, you take ninety four shot attempts and fifteen of your ninety four are blocked. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty rough percentage there. And I wouldn't say, I can't say it's expected because you don't expect to be blocked fifteen times. But the Raptors are smaller. Either mm-hmm. way, though, that's my bad. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, the Raptors shot 44.4% at the rim in this game, a second percentile rim shooting percentage uh, among all teams in a game this season per clean the glass. Not great, Bob. Uh, a great one, Jamar. My bad uh, is simply the Raptors finished 1-15 in against the Atlantic Division. That's crazy, man. Like, the, the Sixers had a long spell of horrible injury. The Knicks had a long spell of injury. Uh, obviously the Nets like actively stink and the Raptors yeah. picked up one single win against the Atlantic division this season. Yes. Their schedule was front loaded with Sixers games and Celtics games and all of that. But man, oh man, that's just like, again, this will come hey. into play on tomorrow's show with one of Joey Cash's bull predictions. So I won't spoil that, but just brutal, brutal stuff against the Atlantic. At least they were not the only team to only win one game in their division. The Portland Trailblazers also did this. That's not That's team. not good. It's not an at least. It's a, oh, you are in the same tier as the Portland Trailblazers. You just made it worse. It went at least we're not really alone. bad to worse, Jamal. At least we're not alone. We're not alone. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not like they were the worst. They were tied for the worst. Oh, man, oh, man. Uh, let's go to the hmm, round it out. What you got for your hmm, Jamar? Actually, actually you go first, because I got to think of one. Okay. Uh, do the Raptors have a new type? Which is, like, instead of formerly really going after 6'9 wings who couldn't shoot, is their new muse 6'11 and over bigs who can't hit twos? Because it sure seems like it. Uh, <laughs> like We know Parlay Porter could not hit a two to save his life. Uh, we also know that uh, Malik Williams last night was two of nine on twos, 24% on twos in his five games so far. And Muhammadu Gay, who's not 6'11", so maybe he doesn't fit this archetype, but he's playing center for this team. One of seven on twos last night, 31.4% on his twos this season in 11 games played. Uh, give it up for Jakob Pertl, the god king of hitting his damn twos. We miss him dearly uh but i hope this is not a recurring thing the raptors are seeking out in their fringe nba bigs <laughs> what you got for your hmm? uh it's not on the level of my uh from the last few pods but i'm just <laughs> wondering if we're gonna get a relatively healthy lineup of barrett quickly olenic hell even bruce brown I, are they gonna play in the last two games i just want to see just one more at least one more time of them playing that's all yes so we want yeah, it just yeah nice i mean spoiler. obviously yeah yeah, because Miami, Miami needs uh, these games. So I, I believe they're fight. I think they can still be the sixth seed. I'm looking it up right now. They're 44 and 36, and Indiana is 46 and 34. So I'm not entirely sure, but they're one game behind Philly, who's sevens. So I mean, they can improve their playing uh, situation. So you know, if the Raptors can play a little bit of spoiler, have you know, there's only two games left, so there's no real reason to rest players anymore and then if you look at the uh six worst record in the league standings per se the raptors are two wins behind memphis memphis is Mm -hmm. 27 and 53 so you know if memphis well i'm hmm, let's see well if the raptors the raptors can go one and one and 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 clinch that but basically i just want to see one more relatively healthy game so. Yeah, I do too. It's fun to watch the cool basketball players on your team play together. Uh, shocking and controversial take. I, I wish uh, also <laughs> we could see that. Uh, of course, if the Heat jump up into the playoff uh, top six uh, tier, the Pacers could drop down and thus make the Raptors pick better, potentially a lottery pick if they yep. don't make it through the play-in. Of course, the doomsday scenario is the Pacers lose out in the play-in, go in the lottery, and then win the lottery 
because it's a top three protected pick that conveys as a second if they do make the top three. So you don't want that doomsday scenario to go down. It would be objectively hilarious if it happened. And so maybe there's a part of me that's hoping to see it because chaos is fun. Um, but yeah, like at this point, the, the, the standing chicanery, I'm done with it. If you finish sixth or seventh in the lottery odds, I frankly don't care. You're it's a coin flip to keep your pick anyway, and the odds say you're going to lose it regardless. So uh who cares? But yeah, uh <laughs> let's uh and losing the pick is good this year. Keep on saying it. Everyone keeps on being like, no, no, we gotta add the sixth overall pick in the tra- in the draft where everyone agrees the top players are bad. No, you have to. Oh my god. Um Anyway, I'll nope. save that for another nope. day. Nope. We got two months nope. of the lottery, so I will, or a month, so I will uh, hold off on further thoughts there. Either way, you have a you have a lot of time to talk about that. A lot of time. You are correct. Uh, boo. All right, <laughs> leave it there. Anything you want to promote for the good people out there? Yeah, you can follow me, Jamar B H J A M A R B H. If you are listening, I have one more Raptors recap. It will be the first of the two Miami games, so you can expect to see that on Saturday morning. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. Awesome, man. Uh, yeah, we'll have you back on in two weeks as we get into off season mode with you as well. Looking forward to that. Uh, in the meantime, thanks so much for tuning in. Follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend. Come back tomorrow as Joseph Casharo and I have the goriest episode of the podcast to date where we take up our preseason bold predictions. We got some stuff oh boy. really, really wrong. We also got a couple things like pretty bang on. So it's not all blood and guts, but there's lots of blood and guts. So you can come for that on friday uh and thanks so much for rocking with the show thanks for following subscribing rating reviewing telling a friend finding us on youtube etc etc and thank you for watching me sync this shot for the second straight Shoot time the with jamar Shoot hines the on the podcast the let's go nah whoa nah, well. i used a different ball today and i almost broke my computer with the bounce back uh bye <laughs>